going back to the you know the drug use and how how far down did you fall? Uh, well, I ended up in rehab by the age of eighteen. Okay, primarily for pornography use because really? I could not stop. Wow! And uh, and I was young, and back then, this was a while ago. Back then, pornography was not recognized universally yet by clinicians as an addiction. Okay. Back then, there were pockets of rehab facilities or or doctors who would say, yes, this has um, addictive tendencies or whatever. They would kind of recognize it. But now it's everyone yes. recognizes it. But at the time, and so we had to find a, a facility out in Arizona and pay top dollar for me to go there because these people were willing to treat this addiction but it was really challenging because as a female, and especially back then, people were like, oh, well, only men, you know, struggle with that addiction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, same thing happened, though, with Alcoholics Anonymous. Back in the 1920s when AA started up, in fact, in the book, there's an entire chapter that's written to the wives because the men were alcoholics. Only men could be an alcoholic in the 1920s. Uh -huh. Now we know very well that yes. women can be like, turns out addiction does not discriminate. Uh -huh. uh, and both men and women can fall into this. Same thing with pornography use. And and I fell into it and I fell hard and I could not stop. And I, and I knew it was wrong and I knew I was crazy. I I ran away one time because my mom called me out on it. And she's like, you have a problem, you can't stop. And I, like uh -huh. I had my laptop there and I was like just chatting to people in like a, a chat room or something. Uh -huh. But she was trying to talk to me and I couldn't even like stop what I was doing to look at her because I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to face the reality because I knew it was true that I couldn't stop watching pornography. And, um, and I got so mad. I, I said, oh, I have a problem. And I slammed my laptop shut and I yanked the cord out of the wall and I, and I left. I like went to my room and packed a bag and I just walked out of my house and started walking. I didn't know where I was going to go or what uh -huh. I was going to do. But that behavior showed me, like she called me on something that I knew was true. But what made me run was that not only did I know it was true and not only did I hate that aspect about myself, but I didn't know how to stop. And it's such a disheartening feeling to know I'm doing something wrong. I'm doing something I don't want to do mm -hmm. that I don't agree with. Yeah. But what choice do I have? Like, I, I've tried to stop. I've tried so many times to limit this or limit that. And, I mean, with addiction, it's so easy to just find another way. Even when you say, okay, well, I'm, I'm only going to drink on these days. Or, okay, well, I'm going to take away my internet at home, my internet access. You, you'll always find a way. And, and I found that to be true with me. And so it was, it was hard. But then when they offered me rehab at the age of 18... I remember agreeing to go because I like I I didn't know what else to do. Uh-huh. So and, you knew I need this. You weren't in denial about that. It was just right. the fact that you didn't know how to I knew I had a problem and I wanted it gone and uh -huh. I didn't know how to do it. And so I went to rehab. It was a 35-day uh, intensive inpatient program. And it was great. I went there with pornography addiction as the primary addiction, but also with chemical dependency use uh -huh. as kind of like a sub addiction. And then um, same thing with like self-harming behavior, that sort of thing. And uh, and it was great because it got me away from like my phone, from computer, from just from life. It got me away from everything to kind of focus on some things and, and do some work. And I came back from that and got a job and started like working my recovery. And I was going to 12-step meetings and I'm – just trying to get back up on my feet. And at about that same time, um, I started to feel this call to like go into mission work and like foreign mission work. And I was like, all right, Lord, hold on. Wait. <laughs> so this whole time before, before you go into rehab, yeah. this whole time, were you still active in the church? Absolutely. So you had this double life. Yes. And that was exhausting. It was exhausting because it was like every Sunday or every time I would go to confession, there was this sincere and genuine desire to change. There was this deep longing for, for more, for Christ, for God himself. And yet it was like the moment I went back to my routine, boom, I was right back in it again. And it just felt like, like insanity. 
Like I felt like a crazy person because I was like, who does this? But but also when you're living a double life, the amount of lies you have to tell and the manipulation and the just like, okay, well, let me do this this way so they, they don't find out and let me do this this way so people don't find out at uh-huh. church. It, like, I mean, just living that way is utterly exhausting. Did and anyone know, have any clues? No, I mean, my family knew I had stuff going on. They uh-huh. knew I was struggling. But I think for the most part, most people didn't think much about it. They, oh, whatever, you know, Brianne's just crazy. or she's Being just, a teenager. She's, yeah, a teenager, whatever. But like, I, I mean, at, at the height of my pornography addiction, I mean, I'm talking, I was watching it all night long, hours of the day, like wow. that sort of thing. Like, And at, at the height of my drinking, like blackout drinking every day, like- it's, and this was alone, not with other people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and part of my addiction going on for so long was because that secrecy and that shame, that level of like, uh, I like no one can know of hiding things and uh-huh. stuff like it just it really festers in that. And I think. I think part of that too is is the devil kind of keeps us longer in some of our habitual sins and some of that broken area because. It's like, oh, well, no one can know. If people find out, no one's going to love you anymore. No one's going to like you. or uh, And so there's this, like, pull to say, okay, well, well, I'll just, I won't tell anyone. I'll just continue to struggle alone and continue to try to fight this uh-huh. alone and not be able to fight it alone. 